Mark is not the gospel of comfort and reassurance, really. Mark starts by telling us that the spirit hurled Jesus into the wilderness as soon as he was baptized. Mark ends with the women who found the empty tomb running away terrified, or at least it originally ended that way before later readers prettied it up. And Mark makes the transition from Jesus' public ministry of teaching and healing to Jesus' last few days on his death on the cross here by telling the having Jesus tell his disciples that the temple they so admire, the temple that has such a good and holy and central role in their mutual faith will be destroyed. Not one stone left on stone with wars and famines and earthquakes along for the ride. And oh yeah, the end is still to come. Mark, and especially today's selection from Mark, maybe isn't what most of us would pick for a celebration Sunday gospel especially to close out a year of community traumas, a year when the world was turned upside down all around us and we still haven't found our equilibrium again. But Mark doesn't sugarcoat and Mark doesn't gush. But Mark does have quite a word for us about what love does. Mark knows that love dares, that love tells the whole story, even the ugly parts. That love shows up even in the midst of wars and famines and earthquakes. That love is brave in the face of real terror. That love is tenacious and brokenhearted and wholehearted and honest. That love never ends. Love in Mark's gospel doesn't always sound quite like we might expect. It's not poetic and pretty like love in 1 Corinthians or Song of Songs. It's not gentle like the promises of comfort we'll hear in a few weeks from Isaiah or complicated like some of the monologues in John's gospel. Love in Mark gets down to brass tacks real fast. So maybe Mark's Jesus talking about destruction and violence and famine is exactly what we need to close out this year after all. Maybe a word about the love that shows up in the middle of insurrections and climate change and racism is how we make the space to celebrate in the middle of so much uncertainty and exhaustion. Because if there's one thing I'm certain of about Good Samaritan right now, one thing I've learned more clearly about this congregation than just about anything else in the seven months we've been doing this church thing together, it's this that most of us are exhausted and fried right now precisely because we have been showing up with honest, real honest to goodness, boots on the ground love for the last 21 months as a congregation and individually. I see it in the way that you all show up on each other's social media posts. It is, I think the very kindest and most real I have seen social media comments ever be. And it's a true expression of love in a place that doesn't see enough of it. I see it in our congregation's commitment to telling the whole story, whether it's in the books that we've put in the Harrison Alpha and Good Sam's libraries, or the witness we've given at school board, even when it's scary, to why diversity, equity, and inclusion are good and holy and necessary goals. I see it I saw it in a way that this congregation said, we've got pride picnic and celebration and ministry on the same day, and it's gonna be hot and it's gonna be windy and it's gonna be rainy, no problem. We'll, uh, we'll roll with it, we'll figure it out and it won't dampen our spirit at all. I see it in the way that this congregation looks to be a partner all the time, sharing what we have, this morning, one of our own, Laura Dreyer, is off at St. Paul's Indianapolis sharing a program about the Reverend Dr. Polly Murray based on a book study she offered here this summer that she said, let's open this to the diocese. And so one of their clergy came and then asked her to re revisit it and, and summarize it for the St. Paul's congregation this morning, who now is getting to learn from her about this icon of Christian witness for justice. 
And I see it in the way that the vision of the village hub, vision that you all stated as a place where the needs and gifts of our neighbors, the Good Samaritan congregation and nonprofit partners will all intersect on a daily basis as a safe space that belongs to the whole community. The hub will be a place to serve others, to be served by others, to learn, to celebrate and honor diversity, to worship and to grow in our abilities to be better neighbors with and for each other. I see the way that the, that vision of that village hub led so many Good Samaritans to push forward on this idea of the new home that we hope for, this new building, even during a pandemic and clergy transition, leading to the grant from Trinity Wall Street that we announced at the beginning of the service that will help us get our architecture work started and is helping drive us toward this partners meeting that will be coming soon to try to do this bold, non-guaranteed, exciting thing. Not because the walls themselves are so important, but because we believe in what the village hub can be and represent and mean for people. Because we believe in the vision of having a place in our community that can serve the goal of loving, serving, and including all people in our community, just as Jesus taught. With all that, it's no wonder that folks are tired. All this, despite all the ways that the world has tried to break us in the last year, from the global trauma of COVID-19 and the isolation and uncertainty it has caused us to national traumas like the January 6th insurrection and the ongoing trials debating whether white violence against black bodies warrants convictions, to personal and local traumas such as the loved ones who have died in the last year, the jobs that have stopped feeling workable or findable, or just the temptation to despair in a world that has done everything it can for the last two years to push us apart from one another. Despite all this, we still come together. Because we know love is the only thing that's gonna get us through. Not silly surface pop song love, as great as silly surface pop songs are, but Mark love, Jesus love, the source of love. Love that literally goes through hell and doesn't hide it and still comes back to get us. Love that says, no matter how you kick us, no matter how you break us, even when you break us, you can't keep us down because love comes back. This kind of love transforms us, not just in the receiving of it, but also in the giving of it. When we give of ourselves with this kind of love, it becomes possible, even when it didn't seem like it should be possible, to find a joy and a sustenance in that giving that lifts us up and keeps us going because this love is more than just a theory or a feeling. Becca Stevens, founder of the Thistle Farms Network of Healing Resources and one of, I would call one of the world's leading experts on love, says experience is nine tenths of love. Standing in a geranium field, smelling dark soil fertilized by rabbit poop is different from reading about the healing properties of geraniums. Walking beside a woman in a refugee camp, covering her baby's face from the dust rising from the dry red dirt is different than imagining how hard it is for moms in camps. The senses transform information into holy compassion. And when we open our hearts to it, we can experience the divine anywhere, like sacred breadcrumbs marking our path. I love that image she offers, sacred breadcrumbs marking our path. It's okay if right now you don't quite feel it, if you're too tired right now to see your way clear, to getting that joy back, to feeling that kind of love. If you're not sure that your bag of breadcrumbs has much in it. Because part of love is that the breadcrumbs don't have to come from our own bag. 
We don't have to bring them in with us. We find the path by finding the breadcrumbs. So I encourage you to do two things, even if you're too tired to see your way clear right now. The first is just to ask God for a grateful and generous heart, not just once, but over and over. The family that the uh, family of the, the first rector I worked for as a priest used to add this on to their graces at meals after a previous associate rector at their parish preached a sermon about grateful and generous hearts. They tacked it onto their, their graces. And so their kids grew up asking God, God's blessing over the food and then saying, and give us grateful and generous hearts. And I remember she was maybe about 17 when one of their daughters received a note from somebody for whom she had done a kind thing. And the note said, you are being given the grateful and generous heart that you have been asking for. And the joy in her face to have somebody say, you have, are being given that grateful and generous heart. It wasn't about whether she felt it. It was becoming true because she asked God to help make it true. So let God work on you and help with that transformation. Don't try to do it all on your own. This is too big for us on our own. Just ask God for a grateful and generous heart. And then take a step out in faith and make your commitments for next year based on reason, certainly. Reason, I, there's a reason that I belong to the Episcopal Church and one of the reasons is because we have a place for reason. We value reason. Reason is important but pledge also based on hope, based on a hope of what we don't yet see, which is what hope is. Make room for God to show up in your life, for this congregation to show up in your life and surprise you and empower you and just see what happens. I wonder, and we can go ahead and put the slide screen up again, I wonder, where have you seen love show up strong through Good Samaritans in the past year? Or how have you seen someone outside Good Samaritan lead with love recently? Or whether you've ever surprised yourself by being able to show up with love even when it was hard, and what that was like. And I invite you to share your answers to these questions in any order in the chat. It doesn't have to be a first, second, and third question other than they just happen to show up that way on the screen. But where have you seen love show up strong through Good Samaritans in the past year? Or, or where have you seen someone outside Good Samaritan lead with love? Or how have you surprised yourself at some point by being able to show up with love even when it was hard? I know one place that um, I think will always be one of my favorite early memories of this congregation and love showing up was not just the fact of the welcome basket that you all put together when I arrived to welcome me, but the way that my doorbell rang and I went to the doorbell and there was this basket outside the door, but there were also these two guys Tim and Steven, I came to know, just running back to their car, giggling madly. And they just waved and said, welcome Mother Beth, with big smiles on their faces and got in the car and drove away. But there was such joy and such welcome and such laughter that I thought, okay, these are my people. <laughs> we can do this together. Courtney shares, my boss leads with love, lifting his staff up continually and making us feel valued. That's, uh, that makes such a big difference in a workplace, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I wonder what else, where have you seen love show up in Good Samaritan, outside Good Samaritan, in yourself? Are there are other examples that you can think of.
Deb says, everyone adapting to new guidelines that change rapidly and continuing to worship together with joy has been incredible. I agree. <laughs> yeah. And Amy says, love and good Samaritans showing up at school board meetings and especially supporting teachers. So many checking on my mom, Charlie says, and parents through COVID and cancer. Yeah. I've seen a lot of that kind of check-in happening on one another's Facebook posts, like I said, and it makes me imagine that, uh, that there's a lot happening in the background too, that we don't necessarily watch each other do. Yeah, I invite you to keep sharing these sorts of things in the chat. Melinda says, our family and friends supporting us this past year as we made and make our move to a new home in Danville. Yeah. Love pours out whenever someone in our congregation is grieving, Deb says. Yeah, that seems to be true. That seems to be a gift of this congregation. Yeah, I think there are a lot of us that have known grief and have been lifted up and know how much that means. Yeah, keep sharing those in the chat as we move forward and affirm our faith together. <laughs> 